Traditions and Encounter by McGraw-Hill. Chapter four, Early Societies in the Americas and the Oceania. Eyewitness, Chan Balam spills blood in, to honor the gods. In early September of the year 683 CE, a Maya man named Chan Balam grasped a sharp obsidian knife and cut three deep slits into the skin of his penis. He inserted each slit, a strip of paper made from beaten bark, tree bark, so as to encourage a continuing flow of blood. His younger brother, Kong Zul, performed a similar rite, and other, fam other members of his family also drew blood from their own bodies. The bloodletting observances of September 683 CE were political and religious rituals, acts of deep pity performed as Chan Balam presided over funeral services. For his recently deceased father, Pakal, king of the Maya city of pa Palanik in the Yucatan Peninsula, the Maya believed that the shedding of royal blood was essential to the, wor to the world's survival. Thus, as Sean Balam prepared to succeed his father as king of Palanc, he let his blood flow copiously. Throughout Mesoamerica, Maya and other peoples performed sim similar rituals for a millennium or and more. Maya rulers and their family members regularly spilled their own blood. Men commonly drew blood from the penis, like Chan Balan, and women often drew from the tongue. Both sexes occasionally drew blood also from the earlobes, lips, or cheeks and they sometimes increase the flow by pulling long, thick cords through their wounds. According to the Maya priests, the gods had shed their own blood to water the earth and nourish crops of maize, and they expected human beings to honor them by imitating their sacrifice. By spilling human blood, the Maya hoped to please the gods and assure that life-giving waters would bring bountiful harvests to their fields. By inflicting painful wounds, not just on their enemies, but on their own bodies as well, the Maya demonstrated their conviction that bloodletting rituals were essential to the coming of rain and the survival of their agricultural society. This agricultural society was the pr product of a distinctive tradition Human groups migrated to the Americas and Oceania long after they had established communities throughout most of the Eastern Hemisphere. But long before any people began to experiment with agriculture, their migrations took place during the last ice age when glaciers locked up much of the Earth's water, causing sea levels all over the world to decline precipitously precipitously, sometimes as much as 300 meters or 984 feet. For thousands of years, temporary land bridges joined regions that both before and after the ice ages were separated by the seas. One land bridge linked Siberia with Alaska. Another joined the continent of Australia to the island of New Guinea. Human groups took advantage of those bridges by migrating to new lands. When the Earth's temperature rose and the glaciers melted, beginning about 18,000 years ago, the waters returned and flooded low-lying lands around the world. Eventually, the seas once again divided Asia from America by the body of water as the Bering Strait. And they also separated Australia and New Guinea. By that time, however, human communities had become well established in each of those areas. Here's the chronological. I'll zoom in on that. The return of high waters did not put an end 
to human migrations, human groups spanned out from Alaska and ventured to all corners of North, Central, and South America, beginning about 3000 BCE. Coastal peoples of Southeast Asia built large sailing canoes and established human settlements in the pre previously uninhabited islands of the Pacific Ocean. By about 700 CE, human beings had established communities in almost every hab habitable part of the world. Although they were separated by large bodies of waters, by no means did human migrants to the Americas and Oceania lead completely isolated lives. On the contrary, there were frequent and sometimes regular interactions between peoples of different societies within the Americas and within the Oceania. It is likely that at least fleeting encounters took place as well as between peoples of the Eastern and Western hemispheres. Although very little evidence survives to throw light on the nature of those encounters in early times, yet even as they dealt with peoples of other societies, the first inhabitants of the Americas and Oceania also established distinctive societies of their own. Despite their different origins and their distinctive political, social, and cultural traditions, peoples of the Americas and Oceania built societies that in some ways resembled those of the Eastern Hemisphere. Human communities independently discovered agriculture in several regions of North America and South America, and migrants in introduced cultivation to the inhabited Pacific Islands as well. With agriculture ca came increasing populations, settlement in towns, specialized labor, formal political authorities, hierarchical social orders, long distance trade, and organized religious traditions. The Americas also generated large, densely populated societies featuring cities, monumental public works, imperial states, and sometimes traditions of writing as well. Thus, like their counterparts in the Eastern Hemisphere, the earliest societies of the Americas and Oceania reflected a common human tendency toward the development of increasingly complex stru social structures. Early Societies of Mesoamerica. Much is unclear about the early population of the Americas by human communities. The first large wave of migration from Siberia to Alaska probably took place about 13,000 BCE, but small numbers of migrants may have crossed the Bering Land Bridge earlier. And it is possible that some migrants reached the Western Hemisphere by watercraft sailing or drifting with the currents from Northeast Asia down the west coast of North America in the view of some scholars. It is also possible that some migrants crossed the Atlantic Ocean and established communities on the eastern coast of North America. Several archaeological excavations at widely scattered sites in both North America and South America have yielded remains that scholars date to 15,000 BCE or earlier, suggesting that at least a few human groups made their way to the Americas before the beginning of large-scale migration from Siberia. In any case, after 13,000 BCE, migrants arrived in large numbers and they quick quickly populated all habitable regions of the Western Hemisphere. By 9,500 BCE, they had reached the southernmost part of South America, more than 17,000 kilometers, 10,566 miles, from the Bering Land Bridge. The earliest human inhabitants of the Americas lived exclusively by hunting and gathering, beginning about 8,000 BCE. However, large game animals became scarce partly because they did not adapt well to the rapidly warming climate and partly because of overhunting by expanding human communities. By 7,500 BCE, many species of 
large animals in the Americas were well on the road to extinction. To survive, some human communities supplemented the foods they gathered with fish and small game. Others turned to agriculture and they gave rest, rise to the first complex societies in the, in the Americas. The Olmecs, early agriculture in Mesoamerica by 8,000 to 7,000 BCE. The peoples, <coughs> excuse me, the peoples of Mesoamerica, the region from the central portion of modern Mexico to Honduras and El Salvador had begun to experiment with cultivation of, of beans, chili peppers, avocados, squashes, and gourds. By 4000 BCE, they had discovered the agricultural potential of maize, which soon became the staple food of the region. Later, they added tomatoes to the crops they cultivated. Agricultural villages appeared soon after 3000 BCE and by 2000 BCE, agriculture had spread throughout Mesoamerica. Early Mesoamerican peoples had a diet rich in cultivated foods, but they did not keep as many animals as their counterparts. In the Eastern Hemisphere, their domesticated animals included turkeys and small barkles, barkless dogs both of which they consumed as food. They had no cattle, sheep, goats, or swine. So far less animal protein was available to them than to their counterparts in the Eastern Hemisphere. In addition, most large animals of the Western Hemisphere were not susceptible for, to domestication. For that reason, Mesoamericans were unable to harness animal energy as did the people of the Eastern Hemisphere. As a result, human laborers prepared foods for fields for cultivation and human porters carried trade goods on their backs. Mesoamericans had no need for wheeled vehicles, which would have been useful only if draft animals had been available to pull them. Ceremonial centers. Toward the end of the second millennium BCE, the tempo of Mesoamerica life quickened as elaborate ceremonial centers with monumental pyramids, temples, and palaces arose alongside the agricultural villages. These were not cities like, that, like those that existed in the Eastern Hemisphere because only members of ruling elite priests and those who tended to their needs were permanent residents Instead, most people lived in surrounding villages and gathered in the ceremonial centers only on special occasions or on market days. Olmecs, the rubber people. The earliest known ceremonial centers of the ancient Americas appeared on the coast of the Gulf of Mexico near the modern Mexican city of Veracruz, and they serve as the nerve center of the Olmecs the first complex society of the Americas. Historians and archeologists have systematically studied Olmec society since the 1940s, and many questions about them remain unanswered. Even their proper name is unknown. The term Olmec, meaning rubber people, did not come from the ancient people themselves, but derives from the rubber trees that flourish in the region they inhabited. Nevertheless, some of the basic features of the Olmec society have become reasonably clear, and it is certain that the Olmec cultural traditions influenced all complex societies of Mesoamerica until the arrival of European peoples in the 16th century CE. The first Olmec ceremonial center arose about 12,000 BCE on the site of the modern town of San Lorenzo, and it served as their capital for some 400 years. When the influence of the San Lorenzo waned, leadership passed to new ceremonial centers at La Ventia, 800 to 400 BCE, and Treso Zapatos, 400 to 100 BCE. 
These sites define the heartland of Omex society, where agriculture produced rich harvest. The entire region receives abundant rainfall. So like the Harrapins, the Omex constructed elaborate drainage systems to divert waters that otherwise might have flooded their fields or destroyed their settlements. Olmec society. Olmec society was probably authoritarian in nature. Common subjects delivered a portion of their harvest for the maintenance of the elite classes living in the ceremonial centers and provided labor for large scale construction projects. Indeed, untold thousands of laborers were required to build the temples, pyramids, altars, sculptures, and tombs that characterize each Olmec ceremonial center. Common subjects also provided appropriate artistic adornment for the elites in Olmec capitals. The most distinctive artistic creation of the Olmecs were colossal human heads, possibly likeness of rulers, sculpted from basalt rock. The largest of these sculptures stands three meters, almost 10 feet tall, and weighs some 20 tons. In the absence of draft animals and wheels, human laborers had to move rocks to the ceremonial centers. The largest sculptures required the service of about 1,000 laborers. Trade in, in jade and obsidian. Olmec influence extended too much of the central and southern regions of modern Mexico and beyond to modern Guatemala and El Salvador. The Olmecs spread their influence partly by military force, but trade was a prominent link between the Olmec heartland and other regions of Mesoamerica. Indeed, the Olmecs obtained both jade and obsidian used for decorative objects and for cutting tools, respectively, from distant regions in the interior of Mesoamerica. Among the many mysteries surrounding the Olmecs, one of the most perplexing concern concerns the decline and fall of their society. The Olmecs systematically destroyed their ceremonial centers at both San Lorenzo and La Venta, and then deserted the sites. Archaeologists studying the sites found statues broken and buried, monuments defaced, and the capitals themselves burned. Although intruders may have ravaged the ceremonial centers, many scholars believe that the Olmecs deliberately destroyed their capitals, perhaps because of civil conflicts or doubts about the effectiveness and legitimacy of the ruling classes. In any case, by about 400 BCE, Olmec society had fallen on hard times and soon thereafter, societies in other parts of Mesoamerica eclipsed it altogether. Nevertheless, Olmec traditions deeply influenced later Mesoamerican societies. Olmecs made astronomical observations and created a calendar to help keep them, keep them, help them keep track of the seasons. They invented a system of writing, although unfortunately little of it survives beyond calendic, calendrical inscriptions. They also carried out rituals involving human sacrifice and invented a distinctive ball game. Later Mesoamerican peoples adopted all these Olmec traditions as well as their cultivation of maize and their construction of ceremonial centers with temple pyramids. The later and better known societies of Mesoamerica stood largely on Olmec foundations. Heirs of the Olmecs, the Maya. During the thousand years of the Olmecs disappearance about 100 BCE, complex societies in several Mesoamerican regions and carried on many of the legacies of the Olmecs. Human population grew dramatically and ceremonial centers cropped up at sites far removed from the Olmec heartland. Some of them evolved into genuine sites, cities that attracted large populations of permanent residents, 
and encourage increasing specialization of labor. Networks of long distance trade linked the new urban centers and extended their influence to all parts of Mesoamerica. Within the cities themselves, priests devised written languages and compiled a body of astronomical knowledge. In short, Mesoamerican societies developed in a manner roughly parallel to that of their counterparts in the Eastern Hemisphere. The Maya. The earliest heirs of the Olmecs were the Maya, who created a remarkable society in the region now occupied by southern Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, Honduras, and El Salvador. Although Maya society originally appeared in the fertile Guatemalan highlands beginning in the 3rd century BCE, after the 4th century CE, it flourished mostly in the poorly drained Mesoamerican lowlands where thin tropical soils quickly lost their fertility to enhance the agricultural potential of their region. The Maya built terraces designed to trap silt carried by the numerous rivers passing through the lowlands. By artificially retaining rich earth, they dramatically increased the agricultural productivity of their lands. They harvested maize in abundance and they culti also cultivated cotton from which they wove fine textiles, highly prized both in their own society and by trading partners in other parts of Mesoamerica. Maya cultivators also raise cacao, the large bean that is the source of chocolate. Cacao was a precious commodity consumed mostly by nobles in Maya society. They whisked powdered cocoa into water to create a stimulating beverage, and they sometimes even ate the bitter cacao beans as snacks. The product was so valuable that the Maya used cacao beans as money. Tikal. The Maya organized themselves politically into scores of small city kingdoms. From about 300 to 900 CE, the Maya built more than 80 large ceremonial centers in the lowlands, all with pyramids, palaces, and temples, as well as numerous smaller settlements. Some of the larger centers attracted dense populations and evoked into genuine cities. Foremost among of them was Tikal, the most important Maya political center between the 4th and 9th centuries CE. At its height, roughly 600 to 800 CE, Tikal was a wealthy and bustling city with a population approaching 40,000. It boasted enormous paved plazas and scores of temples, pyramids, palaces, and public buildings. The temple of the giant jaguar, a stepped pyramid rising sharply to a height of 47 meters, which is 154 feet, dominated the skyline and represented Tikal's control over the surrounding region, which had a population of about 500,000. Maya warfare. The Maya kingdoms fought constantly with one another. Victors generally destroyed the peoples they defeated and took over their ceremonial centers. But the purpose of Maya warfare was not as much to kill enemies as to capture them in hand-to-hand -hand combat on the battlefield. Warriors won enormous prestige when they brought back important captives from neighboring kingdoms. Ultimately, most captives ended their lives either as slaves or as sacrificial victims to Maya gods. High-ranking captives in particular often underwent ritual torture and sacrifice in public ceremonies on important occasions. The chicken, Chishan Itza. Bitter conflicts between small kingdoms were a source of constant tension in Maya society. Only about the 9th century CE did the Chichen Itza in northern Yucatan Peninsula seek to construct a larger society by integrating captives in their own society. Instead of killing them, some captives 
refused the opportunity to, and went to their deaths as proud warriors, but many agreed to recognize the authority of Chichen Itza between the 9th and 11th century CE. Chichen Itza organized a loose empire that brought a measure of political stability to the northern Yucatan. Maya decline. By about 800 BCE, however, most Maya populations had begun to desert their cities. Within a century, Maya society was in full decline everywhere except the northern Yucatan, where Chichen Itza continued to flourish. Historians have suggested many possible causes of the decline, including invasion, internal dissension, and civil war, failure of the system of water control, ecological problems caused by destruction of the forest, of the spread of epidemic diseases and natural catastrophes such as earthquakes. Possibly several problems combined to destroy Maya society. It is likely that debilitating civil conflict and excess siltation of agricultural terraces caused particularly difficult problems for the Maya. In any case, the population declined, the people abandoned their cities, and long-distance trade came to halt, a halt. Meanwhile, the tropical jungles of the lowlands encroached on human settlements and gradually smothered the cities, temples, pyramids, and monuments of a once vibrant city. Society. Maya society and religion. In addition to the kings and ruling families, Maya society included a large class of priests who maintained an elaborate calendar and transmitted knowledge of writing astronomy and mathematics. A heredity nobility owned most of land and co cooperated it with the kings and priests by organizing military forces and participating in religious rituals. Maya merchants also came from the ruling and noble classes because they served not only as traders but also as ambassadors to neighboring lands and allied peoples. Maya society also generated several other distinct social classes. Professional architects and sculptors oversaw construction of large monuments and public buildings. Artisans public specialized in the production of pottery, tools, and cotton textiles. Finally, large classes of peasants and slaves fed the entire society and provided physical labor for the construction of cities and monuments. Building on the achievements of their Olmec predecessors, Maya priests studied astronomy and mathematics, and they just devised both a sophisticated calendar and an elaborate system of writing. They understood the movements of heavenly bodies well enough to plot planetary cycles and to predict eclipses of the sun and the moon. They invented the concept of zero and used a symbol to represent zero mathematically, which facilitated their manipulation of large numbers. By combining their astronomical and mathematical observations, Maya priests calculated the length of the solar year at 365 to 242 days, about 17 seconds shorter than the average, than the figure reached by modern astronomers. The Maya calendar, Maya priests constructed the most elaborate calendar of ancient Americas, which reflected a powerful urge to identify meaningful cycles of, the, of time. The Maya calendar interwove two kinds of year. A solar year of 365 days governed the agricultural cycle and a ritual year of 260 days governed daily affairs by organizing time into 20 months of 13 days apiece. 
The Maya believe that each day derives certain specific characteristics from its position in both the solar and the ritual calendar, and that the combined attributes of each day would determine the fortune of activities undertaken on, oh, I'm sorry, on, oh, I'm sorry, on that day, it took 52 years for the two calendars to work through all possible combinations of days and return simultaneously to their respective starting points. Maya priest studied, uh, carefully studied the various opportunities and dangers that would come together on a given day in hopes that they could determine which activities were safe to initiate. The Maya attributed, uh, attributed especially great significance to 52 year periods in which the two calendars ran. Maya writing, the Maya also expanded on the Olmec tradition of written inscriptions. In doing so, they created the most flexible and sophisticated of all the early American systems of writing. The Maya script contained both ideological elements like Chinese characters and symbols for syllables. Scholars have begun to decipher the script only since the 1960s and it has become clear that writing was just as important to the Maya as it was to early complex societies in the Eastern Hemisphere. Most Maya writing survives today in the form of inscriptions on temples and monuments because 16th century Spanish conquerors and missionaries destroyed untold numbers of books in hopes of undermining native religious beliefs. Today, only four books of the ancient Maya survive, all dealing with astronomical and calendrical matters. Maya creation myths. Surviving inscriptions and other writings shed considerable light on the Maya religious and cultural traditions. The Popol Vuh, a Maya creation of myth, taught that the gods had created human beings out of the out of maize and water, the ingredients that became human flesh and blood. Thus, Maya religious thought reflected the fundamental role of agricultural in their society. Much like religious thought in early complex societies of Eastern Hemisphere, Maya priests also taught that the gods kept in the kept the world going and maintained the agricultural cycle in exchange for honors and sacrifices performed for them by human beings. Bloodletting rituals. The most important of these sacrifices involved the shedding of human blood, which the Maya believed would prompt the gods to send rain to water their crops of maize. Some bloodletting letting rituals centered on war captives. Before sacrificing the victims by decapitation, their captors cut off the ends of their fingers or lacerated their bodies so as to cause a copious flow of blood in honor of the gods. Yet the Maya also frequently and voluntarily shed their own blood as a mean of displaying reverence to their gods. The Maya ball game. Apart from the calendar and sacrificial rituals, the Maya also inherited a distinctive ball game from the Olmecs. The game usually involved teams of two to four members apiece. Its, objects, its object was for players to score points by propelling a rubber ball through a ring or onto a marker without using their hands. The Maya used solid rubber ball about 20 centimeters, which is about eight inches in diameter, which was both heavy and hard. Players needed great dexterity and skill to maneuver it accurately using only their feet, legs, hips, torso, shoulders, or elbows. 
The game was extremely popular. Almost all Maya ceremonial centers and cities had stone paved courts on which players performed publicly. The Maya played the ball game for several reasons. Sometimes individuals competed for sporting purposes and sometimes the game was used as a ritual that honored the conclusion of treaties. High ranking captives often engaged in forced public competition in which the stakes were their very lives. Losers became sacrificial victims and forced faced torture and execution immediately following the match. Alongside some ball game courts were skull racks that bore the decapitated heads of losing players. Thus, Maya concerns to please the gods by shedding human blood extended even to the realm of sport. Gender roles in Maya society. Because the Spanish destroyed nearly all Maya text, not as much is known about gender relations among the Maya as it as is about ancient Mesopotamia, Egypt, or China. Many inscriptions on stone stele survived, but these are concerned almost solely with elite matters. Nevertheless, inscriptions on each on such stele introduced the importance of women in forging marriage alliances. Among ruling families, marital Material evidence, which includes pictorial representations of men and women, the living spaces of families, and the graves of Maya people offer. Further clues about the gender roles of women and men. For example, representations of elite men and women together give men priority of position. In addition, only elite men are depicted in scenes of war playing the ball game, or smoking, suggesting that women did not take part in such activities, that men dominated court life. When women were, are depicted in these representations, they commonly appear in their roles as mothers and male companions. Representations also frequently depict women as weavers, suggesting that textile production was the reserve of women. While pictorial representations generally represent the concerns of elites, excavations of living sites have led scholars to conclude that ordinary men and women collaborated on agricultural examinations of skeletal remains do not include that men were better nourished than women. Thus, while it seems clear that men dominated politics, warfare, and court life. The extent to which men sought to control women through law code and ideas about morality is not. Based on the limited evidence provided by inscription representations and archaeology, some scholars hypothesize that gender relations among Maya were conceived as deeply com complementary and that they were perhaps more egalitarian than Eurasian. I'll go ahead and zoom in on this, the creation of humanity according to Popa Vu. Okay. Erse omics tohitiki. While the Maya flourish in the Mesopotam Mesoamerica lowlands, a different society arose to the north in the highlands of Mexico. For most of human history, the Valley of Central Mexico, situated on two, on some two kilometers, more than a mile above sea level, was the site of several large lakes fed by the waters coming off the surrounding mountains. Although environmental changes have caused most of the lakes to disappear, in earlier times, their abundant supplies of fresh water, fish, and waterfowl ex attracted human settlers. The earliest settlers in the Valley of Mexico channeled some of the waters from the mountain streams 
into their fields and establish a productive agricultural society. The earliest center of this society was the large and bustling city of Tihotikin, located about 50 kilometers, which is about 31 miles northeast of modern Mexico City. The city of Tihotikin was probably a large agricultural village by 500 BCE, but by the end of the millennium, its population approached 50,000. By the year 100 CEE, the city's two most prominent monuments, the colossal pyramids of the sun and the moon, dominated the skyline. The Pyramid of the Sun is the largest single structure in Mesoamerica. It occupies nearly as much space as the Pyramid of Khufu in Egypt, though it stands only half as tall at its high point, about 400 to 600 CE. Zihikin was home to almost 200,000 in inhabitants, a thriving metropolis with scores of temples, several palatial residences, neighborhoods with small apartments for the masses, busy markets and hundreds of workshops for artisans and craftsmen. The organization of a large urban population, along with the hinterland that supported it, required a recognized source of authority. Unfortunately, scholars have little information about the character of that authority, since books and written records from the city did not survive. Yet paintings and murals suggest that Tehitikin was the, the theocracy of sorts. Priest figure prominently in the works of art and scholars interpret many figures as representation of deities. The Society of Teotihuacan. Apart from, the, from rulers and priests, Teotihuacan population included cultivators, artisans, and merchants. Artisan of Teotihuacan were especially famous for their obsidian tools and fine orange pottery. Professional merchants traded the products of Tehikating through Mesoamerica from the region of modern Guatemala City in the south to Durango and beyond in the north. Until about 500 CE, there was little sign of military organization in the Tehikating. The city did not have defensive walls and works of art rarely depicted warriors, yet the influence of the Tehikiti extended to much of modern Mexico and beyond. Apparently, the city's influence derived less from military might than from its ability to produce fine manufactured goods that appealed to consumers in distant markets. Cultural Traditions like the Maya, the residents of the Tehikatekum built on cultural foundations established by the Olmecs. They played the ball game, adapted the Olmec calendar to their own uses, and expanded the Olmecs' graphs, graphic symbols into a complete system of writing. Unfortunately, because their books have all perished, it is impossible to know exactly how they viewed the world and their place in it. Works of art suggest that they recognized an earth god and a rain god, and it is certain that they carried out human sacrifices during their religious rituals. The Decline of Tehikatikin. Tehikatikin began to experience increasing military pressure from other peoples about 500 CE. About the middle of the 8th century, invaders sacked and burned the city, destroying its books, Monu and monuments. After that catastrophe, most residents deserted Tehikatikin, and the city slowly fell into ruin. <sighs> Excuse me. Early societies of South America. By about 12,000 BCE, hunting and gathering peoples had made their way across narrow isthmus of Central America into South America. Those who migrated into the region of northern and central Andes mountains hunted deer, llama, alpaca, and other large animals. 
both the mountainous highlands and the coastal regions below benefited from a cool and moist climate that provided natural harvests of squash, gourds, and wild potatoes. Beginning about 8,000 BCE, however, the climate of this whole region became increasingly warm and dry. And the changes placed pressure on natural food supplies. To maintain their numbers, the human communities of the region began to experiment with agriculture. Here is elsewhere. Agricultural encouraged population growth the establishment of villages and cities, the building of estates and elaboration of organized cultural traditions. During the centuries after 1000 BCE, the central Andean region generated complex societies parallel to those of Mesoamerica, early Andean society, and the Chavin cult. Although they were exact contemporaries, early Mesoamerican and Andean societies developed largely <clears throat> independently, <coughs> excuse me, geographically discouraged the establishment of communications between the Andean region and Mesoamerica because neither society possessed abundant pack animals or technology to facilitate long distance transportation, although some agricultural products and technologies diffused slowly from one area to the other. Neither the Andes Mountains nor the lowlands of modern Panama and Nicaragua offered an attractive highway linking the two regions. Geography made even communications within central Andean region difficult. Deep valleys crease the western flank of the Andes Mountains as rivers drain waters from the highlands to the Pacific Ocean. So, the, so transportation on, and communication between the valleys have always been difficult. Nevertheless, powerful Andean states sometimes overcame the difficulties and influenced human affairs over a broad geographical range. Most of the early Andean heartland came under cultivation between 2500 and 2000 BCE. The coastal regions probably developed complex societies first, since cultivators are experienced abundant harvests as a result of crops such as beans, peanuts, and sweet potatoes, and supplemented them with the rich marine life of the Pacific Ocean. Settlements like likely appeared somewhat later in the Andean highlands, but it is clear that potatoes were being cultivated in the region after 2000 BCE. By 18,000 BCE, peoples in all the Andean regions had begun to fashion distinctive styles of pottery and to build temples and pyramids in large ceremonial centers. The Chavan cult. Shortly after 1000 BCE, a new spiritual belief appeared in the central Andes. The Chavan cult, which enjoyed enormous popularity during 900 to 800 BCE, spread through most of the territory occupied by modern Peru, and then vanished about 300 BCE. Although scholars do not understand the precise significance of the cult, it is clear that Andean society became increasingly complex during this period. Weavers devised techniques of produ producing elaborate, inter intricately patterned cotton textiles. Artisan man Artisans manufactured large, light, and strong fishnets from cotton string. Craftsmen experimented with minerals and discovered techniques of gold, silver, and copper metallurgy and used them to make jewelry as well as small tools. Early cities. There is no evidence to suggest that Chavan cultural and religious beliefs led to the establishment of a state 
or an excuse me organized political order indeed they probably inspired the building of ceremonial centers rather than making of true cities as the population increased and societies became more complex however cities began to appear shortly after the disappearance of the Chavan cult. Beginning about 200 BCE, large cities emerged at the modern day cities of Harai, Pakura, and Tihanaco. Each of these early Andean cities had population exceeding 10,000, and each also featured large public buildings, ceremonial plazas, and extensive re residential districts. Here is a close-up of the map. Early Andean states, Mochica. Along with cities that appear, there appeared regional states. The earliest Andean states arose in the many valleys on the western sides of the mountains. These states emerged when conquerors unified the valleys and organized them into integrated societies. They coordinated the building of irrigation systems so that the lower valleys could support intensive agriculture. And they established trade and exchange works that tied the highlands, the central valleys and the coastal regions together. Each region contributed to its own products to the larger economy of the valley. From the highlands came potatoes, llama meat, and alpaca wood. Wool. I'm sorry. Wool. The central valleys supplied maize, beans, and squash. Squashes. And the coast provided sweet potatoes, fish, and cotton. The Mochia state. Because early Indian societies did not make use of writing, their beliefs, values, and ways of life remain largely hidden. Surviving fortifications as well as art suggest that early Indian states relied heavily on arms to introduce order and maintain stability within their realms. In addition, art from the early Indian state of Mochicha which dominated the coasts and valleys of northern Peru from about 300 to 700 CE, offers a detailed and expressive depiction of early Andean society in all its variety. Most Muchica art survives in the form of pottery vessels, many of which depict individuals, heads, or represent the major gods and various subordinate deities and demons. Most interestingly, perhaps, are those that illustrate scenes that in the everyday life of the Mochica people, warriors leading captives bound by ropes, women working in a textile factory under the careful eye of a supervisor, and beggars looking for handouts on a busy street. Even in the absence of writing, Mochica artists left abundant evidence of a complex society with considerable specialization of labor. Mochica was only one of several large states that dominated the central Andean region during the first millennium CE. Although they integrated the regional economies of the various Andean valleys, none of these early states was able to impose order on the entire region, or even to dominate a portion of it for very long. The exceeding, exceedingly difficult geographical barriers posted by the Andes Mountains presented challenges that ancient technology and social organization could not be met, could not be not meet. As a result, at the end of the first millennium CE, Andean society exhibited regional differences much sharper than those of Mesoamerica and early complex society in the Eastern Hemisphere. Early societies of Oceania. Human migrants entered Australia and New Guinea at least 50,000 years ago and possibly earlier than that. They arrived in watercraft, probably canoes fitted with 
sales. But because of the low sea levels of that era, the migrants did not have to come, did not have to cross large stretches of open ocean. The earliest inhabitants of Oceana also migrated, perhaps over the land when sea levels were still low, to the Bismarcks of the Solomons and other small island groups near New Guinea. Beginning about 5,000 years ago, seafaring peoples from, North, from Southeast Asia settled in the northern coast of New Guinea and then ventured far farther and established communities in the island groups of the Western Pacific Ocean. By middle centuries of the first millennium CE, their descendants had established communities in all ha the habitable islands of the Pacific Ocean. Early societies in Australia and New Guinea. Human migrants reached Australia and New Guinea long before any people had begun to cultivate crops or keep herds of domesticated animals. As a result, the earliest inhabitants of Australia and New Guinea lived by hunting and gathering. Once rising seas covered the land bridge connecting Australia and New Guinea about 10,000 years ago. However, human societies in each area followed radically different paths while Aboriginal peoples of Australia continued as hunting and gathering societies. In New Guinea, communities turned to agriculture beginning about 3000 BCE. The cultivation of root crops such as yams and taro and the keeping of pigs and chickens spread rapidly throughout the island. Early hunting and gathering societies in Australia. Like hunting and gathering peoples elsewhere, the Aboriginal Australians lived in small mobile communities that undertook seasonal migrations in search of food. Over the centuries, they learned to exploit the resources of various ecological regions of Australia, plant foods, including fruits, berries, roots, nuts, seeds, shoots, and green leaves, constituted the bulk of their diet. The supplement of their, the supplement their, to supplement their plant-based diet, they used axes, spears, clubs, nets, lassos, snares, and boomerangs to help bring down animals ranging in size from rats to giant kangaroos, which grew to a height of three meters, almost 10 feet, and to catch fish, waterfowl, and small birds. Austinesian peoples. In New Guinea, Guinea, seafaring peoples from Southeast Asia introduced agriculture to the island about 5,000 years ago when they began to establish tra trading and settlement communities on the northern coast. These sailors spoke Austronesian language, so sorry, whose modern relatives include Malayan, Indonesian, and Polynesian, and were highly skilled in seafaring techni technologies. They sailed the open ocean in large canoes equipped with outriggers which stabilized their craft and reduced the risk of long voyages. By paying close attention to winds, currents, stars, clouds, formations, and other natural indicators, they learned how to find distant lands reliably and return home safely. Early agriculture in New Guinea, Austronesian seafarers came from societies that depended on the cultivation of root crops and the herding of animals. When they settled in New Guinea, they introduced yams, taro, pigs, and chicken to the island, and the ind indigenous peoples themselves soon followed suit. Within a few centuries, agriculture and herding had spread to all parts of New Guinea. There is in other lands, agriculture brought population growth and specialization of labor. After the change of ag to agriculture, permanent settlements, pottery, and carefully crafted tools appeared throughout the island. The peopling of the Pacific Islands, 
Austronesian migrants to Polynesia. Austronesian speak speaking peoples possessed a sophisticated maritime technology as well as agricultural e expertise, and they established human settlements in the islands of the Pacific Ocean. Their outrigger canoes enabled them to sail safely over long distances of open ocean, and their food crops and domesticated animals enabled them to establish agricultural societies in the islands. Once they had established coastal settlements in New Guinea, Austronesian seafarers sailed easily to the Bismarck and Solomon Islands uh, east of New Guinea. From there, they undertook exploratory voyages that led them to previously unpopulated islands. By about 1500 BCE, Austronesian mariners had arrived at Venuta, formerly called New Abrid, Eads and New Caledonia. I am so sorry if I mispronounce those. By 13,000 BCE at Fiji and by 1000 BCE at Tonga and Samoa. During the late centuries of the first millennium BCE, they established settlements in Tahiti and Marques Casas. From there, they launched ventures that took them to the most remote outpost of Polynesia, which required them to sail over thousands of nautical miles over blue water. They reached the islands of Hawaii in the early centuries CE, Easter Island by 300 CE, and the large islands of New Zealand by 700 CE. Austronesian migrants to Micronesia and Madagascar, while one branch of the Austronesian speaking peoples populated the islands of Polynesia. Other branches sailed in different directions from the Philippines. Some ventured to the regions of Micronesia, which include small islands and atolls, such as the Mar Mariana, Caroline, and Marshall Islands of the Western Pacific. Others looked west from their homelands in Indonesia, sailed throughout the Indian Ocean, and became the first human settlers of the large island of Madagascar off the East African coast. The Lapita peoples. The earliest Austronesian migrants to sail out into the blue water of the Pacific Ocean and establish human settlements in Pacific Islands are known as the Lapita peoples. No one knows what they call themselves. The name Lapita comes from a beach in New Caled Caledonia, where some of the earliest recognizable Lapita artifacts <clears throat> came to the attention of archeologists. It is clear, however, that between 1500 and 500 BCE, Lapita peoples maintained communication and exchange networks throughout a large region, extending about 4,500 kilometers, which is about 2,800 miles from New Guinea and the Bismarck Archipelago to Samoa and Tonga. Wherever they settled, Lapita peoples established agricultural villages where they raised pigs and chickens and introduced the sweet crop of crops they inherited from their Austronesian ancestors. <coughs> Excuse me. They supplemented their crops and domesticated animals with fish and seaweed from the nearby waters, and they soon killed off most of the large land animals and birds that were suitable for human consumption. They left abundant evidence of their presence in the form of their distinctive pottery decorated with stamped geometric designs. For about 1,000 years, Lapita peoples maintained extensive networks of trade and communication across the vast stretches of open ocean. Their agricultural sediments were largely self-sufficient, but they placed high value on some objects from distant lands. Their pottery was a principal item of long distance exchange, as was highly quali or high quality obsidian, which they sometimes transported over thousands of kilometers, since it was only available at one, a few sites at Lapita settlement. Other trade items bought to light by archaeologists include 
shell jewelry, and stone tools. Indeed, it is clear that they're like their counterparts in other regions of the world, the earliest inhabitants of the Pacific Islands maintained regular contacts with peoples well beyond their own societies. Chiefly political organization. After about 500 BCE, trade networks fell into disuse, probably because the various Lapidus settlements had grown large enough that they could supply their own needs. By the middle part of the first millennium BCE, Lapita and other Austronesian peoples had established hierarchical chieftains in the Pacific Islands. Contests for power and influence between ambitious subordinates frequently caused tension and turmoil, but the possibility of the migration offered an alternative to conflict. Indeed, the set spread of Austronesian peoples throughout the Pacific Islands came about partly because of population pressure and conflicts that encouraged small parties to seek fresh opportunities in more hospitable lands. Over the longer term, descendants of the Lapita peoples built strong, chiefly societies, particularly on large islands with relatively dense populations, such as those the Tongan, Samoan, and Hawaiian groups in Hawaii, for example, military skilled chiefs co cooperated closely with priests, administers, soldiers, and servants in ruling their districts. Chiefs in their routines, uh, retin, retinues, I'm so sorry, I don't know the word, and their retinues claimed a portion of the agricultural su surplus produced by their subjects, and they sometimes required subjects to deliver additional products such as fish, birds, or timber. Chiefs and their administrators also vied with the ruling classes of neighboring districts, led public ritual observances, and oversaw irrigation systems that watered the taro plants that were crucial to the survival of Hawaiian society. Eventually, the chief and aristocrat classes became so entrenched and powerful that they regarded themselves as divine or semi-divine, and the law of the land provided prohibited common subjects from even gazing directly at them. That is the end of chapter four. I'm so sorry. That is the end of chapter four. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.